Walter said, after he's been created, the mold was destroyed. There's only one of him. And then he looked at me, I, he, he said, I think after you were made, your mold were also destroyed. He said to me, you know, we are two strange people, funny people. But every one of you are unique. You are the only one of a kind. And we have to ex accept people as they are. Don't try and change one another. You can only change in an atmosphere of acceptance. Uh, can you remember the name of this place? You get zero out of a hundred. <laughs> this is Nar El Kelp. And I met some Lebanese people and when they saw it, they recognized it and they became homesick. What happened to my heart when I saw the name of Nabukuduri Usar for the first time in Lebanon? Oh, my heart was strangely warmed. You know, we need warm hearts in a cold world. And let's warm up one another's hearts. You're looking at a very interesting brick from Babylon. Guess who is the author here? Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, who were the, the only two sources mentioning his name until recently? The Bible and Josephus. The spade confirms the book, always. Guess how many administrative and contract tablets dated according to the days, months, and years of Nebuchadnezzar's reign have been excavated? Guess. Seven. Do you belong to the Seventh day Adventist Church? Have you got a hang up about seven? Up to date 500 and they're still discovering tablets. And I've got so much to tell you, but Ray said, short and sweet. He's my boss and I'll carry on. Here you see some of the tablets discovered, displayed in the British Museum. Babylonian Chronicle, which gives you the first 11 years of this man's life. And this little one, Nebu Sarsikim, the head of the eunuchs. They discovered this as well. Stones crying out. The book is true. Some more creation and flood stories. But the biblical story of creation and flood is the best. Also there are about 30 building and honorific inscriptions. Most, mostly on stone cylinders and bricks. This is just one of them. If you go to the British Museum, all five, five. You'll spend the day just reading these clay tablets. They all cry out, the Bible is true. The stones cry out. The book is true. Now the most important one is called the East India House Inscription. That was just the headquarters of this company in Baghdad. The 621 lines of script describe his fortification of Babylon and restoring the old palace and the building of a new one. Previously to this, they believed that Semiramus was the builder of Babylon. But no, it was Nebuchadnezzar as the Bible tells us. You know, while looking at this interesting stone, I thought of a verse in the Bible that speaks of Nebuchadnezzar's boastful nature. He was arrogant. Arrogant. Big mouth. I'm so glad the Americans are very timid, kind people. 
Now the two accounts complement one another. The Bible and this inscription. Daniel 4, 29, 30, at the end of the 12 months, he was walking about the royal palace of Babylon. Can you see him walking there? Man, he felt so proud. Can we sharpen the, the focus here? I, I think it's possible. If not, just use your imagination. The king spoke, saying, Is not this looking at the city? Is not this the great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? We call this megalomania. And using the personal pronoun in mental institutions of 30% more than ordinary people like you and me. So the more you speak about the sel yourself, the more mental you are. <laughs> this is what archaeology tells me. Okay, we're going to look for an inscription where he boasts about his greatness. This is Nineveh. I searched there. Will we find an inscription that would contain the boastful nature of Nebuchadnezzar's speech in the Bible? Well, I walked here, I looked around, I read literature, I didn't find found anything. Then, this is Walter, this is a place called Karkemish, referring to the god Chemos, which is mentioned on the Moabite stone, which was discovered at Diban in Jordan, where the tetragrammaton was mentioned for the first time outside the Bible, the four-letter word of Yahweh, Mesha, Omri, Ayab, this was a marvelous discovery. But here we are at Karkemesh. And Walter helped me while we looked at the site. We couldn't find it at that site, so he got on a motorbike. And Walter was off. He couldn't drive it, but he went with a Kurt. But we couldn't find the inscription. Do you believe this, Janet? Don't underestimate my friend Walter. There was no time to leave an account of his first great victory at Karkemish, 609, so we move on. These are Lebanese people who helped us find the historic site. I was so excited when I visited here. On these rocks, he tells the world what an important, mighty man he is. And when you read the inscription here, you can hear the harmony between Daniel chapter 4 and this inscription. Now, what do you notice on this picture? The, the cuneiform are not so clear anymore, but there is an image of a man. The years eroded the marvelous script. But there it is. Uh, was there someone who could translate it? You know, I went from here to two of the universities. I said, please decipher this for me. Because it was very vague and they couldn't. And then I got hold of a book called Ancient Near Eastern Text. And here was the account, the translation of the Wadi Briza inscription. I was so happy. Do you notice the king's head? Eventually, I got the translation, as I said, and I read it. And I'm going to share something with you tonight. I don't think any of you have ever heard it before. This did something to my heart. My heart was... You're right. <laughs> Shall we ask Walter to read some of the cuneiform? Do you mind if he reads it? I said, all right. I think he's going to read it in English. Let's, let's see. 
From the upper sea rides Nabukuduri Usar to the lower sea, one line destroyed, which Marduk, Bel Marduk was the, the most prominent Babylonian god in the pantheon of Babylonian gods. Marduk, my lord, has entrusted to me, I have made the city of Babylon the foremost among all the countries and every human habitation. Its name I have elevated to the most worthy of praise among the sacred cities. Can you hear the message? The harmony? Daniel 5.30 says, Is not this the great Babylon? I have built. As the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty. And then the inscription on the Wadi Briza, I have made Babylon the foremost among all the countries. Its name I have elevated to the most worthy of praise among the sacred cities. You know, Jesus was the Son of God, but so humble. What a contrast. Please be humble. The most powerful argument in favor of Christianity is a loving and a lovable Christian. Wadi Briza, Lebanon. When I studied the similarities of these two accounts, my heart was... The Bible is true, especially when it comes to the book of Daniel. So much has been discovered concerning this book. I've just completed a year and a half's research on the book of Daniel, bringing in archaeology in all the chapters. And this book became a new book to me. Let's have a quick visit to the ancient city of Babylon. Your impressions about this? Who's this man? Who's this? Cyrus the Great. He's telling the story of what happened here. This is biblical. Well, do you recognize this? I had it on the screen before. Entrance to the city, he restored the southern palace of Babylon with 60 million bricks. And here Loretta and I pose for the camera at the entrance. Do you think the picture came out well? Yes. They don't do close-ups of me. Guess the name of the new builder. Yes. Every three meters he had an inscription of himself saying the same thing that Nebuchadnezzar said, I am the builder of this great new Babylon. This is the original builder, Nebuchadnezzar, telling the story that he built the place. I, I, I. And then we visited the uh, courtyard where a thousand pe people had a feast. On the 12th of October, 539, when the city was destroyed. Somewhere on the plain of Dura, that means the space between two walls, the king erected a huge golden image. Why? Why do we erect great things? Daniel 3, verse 1, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its width 6 cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. There it is. Did they use num numerals like this in ancient Babylon? Is the Bible correct? Yeah. Archaeology says yes. This is where the 666 comes from. The numeral 60, which is mentioned here, 
represented the unity of the Babylonian nation. This is what the clay, tab clay tablets tell us. And the king Nebuchadnezzar sent word to gather together the satraps, the administrator, administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. By the way, some scholars say this was an image of Belmarduk, his God. Was this decree local or international? International. Eschatology. The book of Daniel speaks about the time of the end. So this story tells us exactly what's going to happen at the end of time. That's why the critics of the Bible want to destroy the credibility of the book Daniel. If you do not study Daniel, you're lost. So the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered together for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Can you see the crowd standing before the golden image? How did the ancient world respond to the call by the king of Babylon to worship the image? Was there unity? Yes, they were all there. Even the king Zedekiah of Jerusalem. He didn't worship the, the image. He just pretended that he worshipped the image. Eschatology? We get a picture of the time of the end. Then, I, then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O peoples, nations and languages, universal, that at the time you hear the rock, uh, sorry, the, the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, in symphony with all the kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the golden image that the king Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Worship and music. What would happen to those who refuse to break God's law and be influenced by the Babylonian music? Eschatology. Read these messages. Get ready, it's going to be repeated. Verse 6, and whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Is this account factual or fiction? It's factual. If it is fiction, the eschatology of Revelation 13 falls apart. The devil doesn't want people to believe in the book of Daniel. And there's such a confusion in the interpretation of this book. Revelation 13, 15, he was granted power, like Nebuchadnezzar, to give breadth to the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He's taking his vocabulary from Daniel chapter 3. You have to understand Daniel chapter 3 to appreciate what's going to happen very, very soon. The decree in ancient Babylon centered around worship. Worship God's law or worship contradictory human decrees. Now, can archaeology confirm the erection of such an image by Nebuchadnezzar? I cannot tell you how excited I was when I read it. And my heart was... 
Now God has preserved these 2,500 year old inscriptions of Wadi Briza in Lebanon to strengthen our faith in his word. Listen to this coming from Near Eastern, Near ancient Near Eastern text, 305. In order that nobody might do any harm to them, I erected there a stila. Here goes the golden image. Showing me as everlasting king of this region. Beside my statue as king, I wrote an inscription mentioning my name. I erected for posterity. Are you excited about this? Wonderful. Wow. Does the book of Daniel mention the erection of the statue? Yes, we've just read it. The inscription of Wadi Briza confirms the authenticity of the Bible. Look at the cuneiform. And if you have the book, get it from a library and read it for yourself. It's quite lengthy. What Nebuchadnezzar did at Babylon, he repeated in Lebanon. And maybe they will still find some more similar information. My heart was strangely warmed. I saw the image on the Wadi Briza inscription in Lebanon. What else does he mention in this description? He says, I erected the stela showing me as the everlasting king. Beside my statue as king, I wrote an inscription mentioning my name. But listen to this one. My future kings, and remember when you read the Babylonian king, transfer your thoughts to the end time Babylonian king. And Walter will tell you all about this king. May future kings respect the monuments, the image I've erected. Remember the praise of the gods inscribed thereupon. He who respects my royal name, who does not abrogate my statues and not change my decrees, don't touch my decrees, don't change them, his throne shall be secure. His life lasts long. His dynasty shall continue. So the king of Babylon in ancient times offered prosperity if you obey his laws which are contrary to God's laws. You get the same thing in the book of Revelation. The king of Babylon promised them security if they obeyed his laws. Does that include financial gain? Does the book of Revelation speak about financial gain? Were his decrees in conflict with God's decrees? Yes, it's going to happen again. What if his kings disobey his decrees? No financial prosperity. You will not be able to buy or sell. What is the message of Revelation 17 and 18? It's just an enlargement of the message of Daniel chapter 3. In order to understand the book of Revelation, we have to study the book of Daniel. He causes all both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. This is the message of Wadi Briza. For the first time, archaeologists discover it, and it is in harmony with the message of the book of Revelation. Where are we and why are we here at this site? Tyre, yes. I just show a picture and everybody knows about it. I feel intimidated by your intelligence. 
Let me just go back. Here you can see a typical siege of a city. This was taken in the British Museum. It is Nebuchadnezzar destroyed, no, sorry, Sennacherib, Sennacherib, 701, destroying Lakish in Israel. Look at, look at the way they, they went about. They destroyed the Syrians, every single country they fought. Now it says in Ezekiel 26, 7 and 8, For thus saith, says the Lord, Behold, I will bring against Tyre from the north, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, king of kings, with horses, with chariots, and with horsemen, and an army with many people. This was predicted in 586. Against the mightiest coastal city of antiquity. Says, Babylon is coming to destroy you. Look at this. This is an ancient tank with a battering ram. It's interesting to watch the way they fought. Verse 8, He will slay with a sword your daughter, villages in the fields. He will heap a siege mound. This is a siege mound against you. Build a wall against you. That's the wall. And raise a defense against you. So when you have archaeology, put the Bible next to it and you can see the picture. Why would the city be destroyed? Why do God destroy cities and people? I got a shock when I discovered the reason and I felt so guilty. Ezekiel 26, 1 and 2, in the 11th year, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came to me, Ezekiel. He mentions dates. The Babylonian Chronicle mentions dates, so we know exactly when this happened. This is in the year 586 BC, in which Jerusalem fell. Verses 2 and 3. Son of man, because Tyre has said of Jerusalem, Aha! Sadism? What do you call it? When you rejoice in someone's misery. Aha! It's interesting to look at the Hebrew here. The gate to the nations is broken. Judah was on the crossroads. And its doors have swung open to me. Now that she lies in ruins, I will prosper. This is cruel. Are you guilty if your enemy hurts, rejoicing? That's not Christ-like. He wept over Jerusalem. Therefore, because of this, therefore this is what the Sovereign Lord says, I am against you, O Tyre. And I will bring many nations against you, like the sea casting up its waves. You know, when we were small, my brother and myself, we were very poor, just after the Great Depression. And when he got a hiding, we slept together in a small bed. I said, ha ha ha. He was doing this to his ex posterior. Is that what you call it? Bum. You know, when I got a hiding, guess what he did? Ah! May God help us to pick up an enemy and not trample on an enemy. A great city and a nation were destroyed because of this attitude. The fall of Jerusalem would open the way for Tyre to get the monopoly of the trade route in Judah. They were looking for money. Traders from Egypt in the south and Syria and Babylon in the north had to pass through Judah and now Tyre could get the monopoly. How long did the siege of Tyre by Nebuchadnezzar last? 13 years? The longest siege in archaeology. 
Eventually, he destroyed the city, but the rubble remained on mainland. Now, what happened after the fall of mainland Tyre? The people moved from here to an island. This was about a kilometer. I believe you're still working on miles. Way behind a great nation like South Africa. But we're waiting for you. Don't catch up. So there was an island. So they built a new city. A new tire. So when Alexander the Great crossed the Dardanelles, the entire region, the Levant, surrendered to him. Except this little island. Because they were safe. How long did the new island of Tyre enjoy freedom? Till Nebuchadnezzar came. What did Ezekiel predict? What would happen to Tyre? Let's read it. Verse 12. They will plunder your wealth and loot your merchandise. They will break down your walls and demolish your fine houses and throw your stones, timber, timber and rubble into the sea. Now, those who visited Lebanon and went to Baalbek, there's one column weighing 2,000 tons. He had a little crack in, so they did not use it for building material. You cannot imagine that anybody would be able to take the ruins of a city and dump it into the sea. But God said this, and let's see how archaeology confirms what the Bible says. How did Alexander the Great fulfill the prophecy for about more than two centuries? The ruins of ancient Tyre on mainland challenged the prophecy. The prophecy said this city would be dumped into the sea. And there it was. Well, when Alexander the Great came here, they wouldn't surrender. So he sent in his ships, but the ships couldn't do anything because they had iron poles preventing ships to enter. Guess what he did? He told his soldiers, build me a bridge to the island. After seven months, the bridge was completed, the ramp, and Tyre, mainland Tyre was in the sea, prophecy fulfilled. Isn't that wonderful? My heart was strangely warmed. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the city. Alexander dumped the ruins in the sea. Two rulers fulfilled Ezekiel's prophecy, 26 verse 12. Sometimes we're in a hurry for God to answer our prayers. Wait a little while. It's coming. Maybe two centuries or three. <laughs> Will the bad Nebuchadnezzar be in heaven one day? And wicked me and perhaps wicked you? Will we, will we be there? You will only be lost if you refuse salvation. Not because you've sinned, but because you have refused such a great salvation. What happened after Daniel interpreted the king's dream? Well, he said, surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings. He had a conversion in 603. He went to Sabbath school for the first three months, studied his Sabbath school lesson and read Patriarchs and Prophets, and then he stopped. And guess what happened to, the, to him? He went back to his old church, worshipping Bel Marduk and Nabu. So God said, I've, I'm done with you. No. What happened after the king had cast three Hebrews in a fiery furnace for not worshipping the golden image? 
He had another conversion. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel to rescue his servants. Another conversion after many years. Maybe you've got a loved one, a son or a daughter. They were converted at some stage, but they're gone. There could be a second conversion. I'll, I'll just skip this and, and uh, rush ahead. What happened after this first conversion? He didn't study his Sabbath school lesson. He didn't read Patriarchs and Prophets. Would the second conversion last? Why not? He forgot to study his Sabbath school lesson. Would God give him another chance? Will he give me another chance? And you? I serve a God that gives us more and more chances. He forgot the fourth man in the fiery furnace and thought only about his own greatness. Who's your greatest enemy? Yourself. You thought it was your wife. You're wrong, my brother. It's you. Where do you think I'm sitting? This is the foundations of the Tower of Babel. I've got a lecture on that. The Etamanaki, foundation of heaven and earth. And when I visit these sites, I just let my imagination go. Relive history. This is how he prayed. He said, O oh Marduk, this is Nebuchadnezzar, my Lord, was a golden image right on top of the Etamananki. Uh, do, do remember my deeds favorably. Give merit to my deeds. I want to earn heaven through my deeds. As good deeds may these my good deeds be always before you, before your mind, so that my walking in the Esagila and Ezida, which I love, my last to old age. Salvation by personal effort. That is the Babylonian religion. I'm glad I discovered the prayer. This is how they prayed. Extolling your good works. Like the Pharisee, I'm so good. And that man at the back, he's so bad. Yeah. Which scripture did Nebuchadnezzar forget? Tell me. Ephesians 2, 8 to 10. He didn't read his New Testament. <laughs> he read the Babylonian rubbish. I mean scriptures. <laughs> Does God care about rejectors of his grace? Are you sure? Yes. I like archaeology. Listen to this. 4.27, therefore, O king, let my advice be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by being righteous and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. This is the gospel. Daniel addresses the king. This is your problem. Be kind to people. He became cruel. Perhaps there may be a lengthening of your prosperity through kindness. Did the proud, cruel king heed the warning message? Do we always listen to the message? No. Is God patient with us? Yes. Oh, so patient. Is God going to give this king, give up on this king? No. no. Daniel 4, 28, 29. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar at the end of the 12 months. He was walking about the royal palace of Babylon. There was only one man that counted. It was him. Verse 30. The king spoke saying, Is not this the great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power? and for the honor of my majesty. 
If you want to destroy yourself, concentrate on yourself. So easy. Commit suicide by being egocentric. Verse 31. While the word was still in the king's mouth. Now, we're looking at more than 50 years that God battled to enter this man's heart. While the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar. To you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you. Does God still care when I too lose my kingdom? Yes. 32. And they shall drive you from men. You're a lunatic. And your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make you eat grass. They didn't use a lawnmower after this incident. <laughs> they shall make you eat grass like oxen. And seven times shall pass over you. Until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. Bush, Obama, you know, he gives it to whoever he chooses. But does he still care about us when we become cuckoos? You know, the book of Daniel gives you a beautiful picture of God. Unbelievable. They discovered a broken tablet which was published in 1975 concerning Nebuchadnezzar. Life has lost, has lost its meaning. He shows no love for his son or daughter. Family ties ceased. Is there hope for someone who destroyed his family? Maybe you destroyed your family. Maybe you're guilt-ridden. Does God forgive people who destroy their families? We serve a wonderful God. Verse 34. At the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven. And my understanding returned to me. What happens when broken, empty people look up? Their understanding returns. Don't concentrate on your performance. You become miserable. Concentrate on the performance of your Savior. His merits will take you to heaven. Verse 34. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored Him who lives forever. The final conversion. Nebuchadnezzar looks up and sees the rock Jesus who is coming to redeem the world of its mess. And his understanding came back. By beholding Christ, his heart was strangely warmed. Please look at him. At such a beautiful view, he cares for you. He also sees Jesus supporting his persecuted children in the fiery furnaces of life. And the wicked king beholds God with his, and his eyes become soft and kind. You know, insane people have got wild eyes. And suddenly his eyes change. This is what happens when we have an upward look. Our downward look changes. His hardened heart starts melting 
tears of joyous repentance flows over his face. Where is my focus? You know, we have to refocus continually on my mess or on a forgiving God. Please sing the song for me. Patriarchs and Prophets and Kings says, The public proclamation in which Nebuchadnezzar acknowledged the mercy and goodness and authority of God was the last act of his life recorded in sacred history. He died later that year a saved man. I'm going to speak to him about Wadi Briza and Nar El Kelp and a few other inscriptions. One of these days, excuse me for a million, million years, I quickly want to speak to Nebuchadnezzar. The rock that Nebuchadnezzar saw and accepted is on his way. Please accept his invitation to the land without tears. Next to each person there's a puddle of tears. Some have got more than others. But there's a land of undisturbed happiness. Undisturbed peace. A land free from our fallen nature. I want to meet you there. Please don't disappoint me. Where's Pastor Bob? He's got the last word. Pastor Bob. Could you do it a little faster? <laughs> Remember the last movements will be rapid movements. You know how to humble a guy, don't you? <laughs> Justification is putting man's glory in the dust. Okay. Okay. I accept that. No, it's not on. Nope. There we go. There we go. They just didn't turn it on in the back. Are we going to do it? A couple of questions? Or take a break? We've been sitting for a long time. Let's take a little bit of a break. Come back here. And we'll have this theme song and a prayer, and then we'll jump right in to our lecture. <laughs>